Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Man, there's so much joy in this place. I'm not kidding you. Like, I was like, wow, I'm standing in the back. I'm like, wow, these people are in it to win it. Did you enjoy last week kickoff of Back to School? Okay, well, today we're going to take it to the next level. Are you guys ready for the next level? Yes. Let's pray. Let's all close our eyes, and let's really make this moment a moment where we're telling God that he has our full attention. Father, we're praying that this morning we came in like students. We know that the Bible says that we're your disciples. That means we're students, we're learners, we're growers. And I pray that today we have ears to hear, eyes to see, a heart ready to receive the implanted word of God that can bring change, that brings hope, that brings freedom, that brings answers. I ask you, Father, that today there would be no distractions, that we are focused, we are dialed in, Father. We didn't come to church to be distracted with texts, phone calls, or even our stomach, king stomach. We dethrone you right now. <laughs> and Lord, I thank you that we, we came with the intention to draw closer to you, to grow deeper in you, to walk away this day, Father God, being better than when we first walked in. Because improvement is what we want. And so, Father, today, lift your hands to heaven. Just say, Lord, my, my attention is yours. I'm focused. I'm zeroed in. I'm the best student in this class. In Jesus' name, amen. If any student starts kind of like moving around in their chairs or whatever or wants to get up, you just sit them back down. Like, sit down, relax. Go to the bathroom after class. Amen? All right. You guys ready? All right. Let's get into this real quick. If I can please get that. How many know... That when you went to school, actually, let's start with this. If eight cups of coffee um, sponsors one child in Oaxaca for one month, how many cups will it take to sponsor one child for a whole year? Who, who knows the answer? You guys are so good. Wow. We got to work on our questions. But we, need, we need harder problems. I should just make one up, and it just really doesn't make any sense. And get all of you just thinking, and it's going to be like, no, there's no answer for it. Yeah, but 96, so uh, you, can, uh, you can change a child's life in a year if you give up some coffee, which I know it's, it's not easy, but uh, it's awesome. Okay, so how many know that it's a choice when you and I went to school, and uh, for some of us, we kind of regret it because we wish we were the student that... We are today a little bit more focused, a little bit more intentional, but when you're a child, you act like a child, you talk like a child, you live like a child, you think like a child, and then you grow up and hopefully you've already put away some childish things, right? And so you choose the type of student you want to be in your class, and maybe some of you are still going to school, maybe you went back to school, maybe you're in college now, but that's your decision. Nobody can make you learn. Nobody can make you grow. Nobody can make you have the desire to develop your skill sets. That is your responsibility. Same way goes for your job. You know, you can be working at a company for X amount of years and have the same position for 15, 20, 30 years, and there is no progress. I pray that you would be the kind of people that whatever your hands find to do, Man, you prosper that thing. Man, you make that thing grow. Wherever these little feet go, man, wherever the sole of your feet touch, man, you have good success. And that's what we have to be as the church, especially as believers. We should be the best employees. We should be the best followers of Christ. We should be the best contributors in this world. We should be the best thinkers. We should be the best innovators, the best creators. We should be the best of the best of the best because God gave his very best. Can we give God a big hand for that one there? <clears throat> However, 
Notice I didn't say but. However, you also decide what kind of follower, what kind of believer, what kind of disciple, what kind of student that you're going to be the moment you gave your life to Christ. No one can make you grow when it comes to your spiritual walk with God. No one's going to make you grow. No one's going to, you know, yell at you to grow. It is a personal decision that you have to make to grow up. And just let me, let me say this. Just because people go to church does not mean they're growing. Amen. There's a lot of, lot of Christians that go to church every single week, but they still have the same habits, same behavior, same attitudes. And I'm not talking about good ones either. You know, still complaining, still bickering, still moaning, still pointing the finger, still angry, still upset, still gossiping, still slandering. And there's a lot of things that haven't changed. And if you remember last week, we, we, we took that verse where the scripture says, you know what, um, you are a new creature. That means that you're a new person. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New. But isn't it interesting that so often we, we meet wonderful people that love God. They do. They love God. That haven't changed. They're, they're, still, they're still trying to live this new life with the old lifestyle, the old mindset, the old behaviors, the old, you, you, you can finish the sentences, and, and nothing changes. And um, what ends up happening is, you know, we start kind of, you know, This look weird. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> and and look, leave the little child's like, hey man, give me some. <laughs> Don't hog it. This looks weird, doesn't it? I mean, just think this way. I wonder how many of us still walk around. With the Baba. Can you imagine, you know, just think the church if a whole bunch of us walked in every Sunday and we're like, <laughs> <laughs> right? They're playing my jam. And in between my jam, I take a Baba break, right? Or you're, or you're interacting with people. You're in a meeting. You're in a meeting. You're working. And you got your Baba right next to you. You go, you go to the restaurant, you go to the coffee shop, you go wherever you go, you go to school. Listen, just because you're a youth, a young adult, doesn't mean that you have to be sucking the baba. It, it, it doesn't mean that. Or you go to the restaurant, the waitress comes to you, say, can I take your order? You're like, no, I'm good. I mean, it looks very, very silly to be a Christian to be a grown adult and to be walking around drinking milk out of a baby bottle. But haven't you noticed that in, in Christianity today, you do have a lot of Christians that walk around acting like a baby, talking like a baby, having baby issues. And, and then... It's kind of irritating. It's kind of bothersome, I think, sometimes when you're constantly having to interact with people that have been walking with God as long as you, if not longer than you, and, and yet they're still walking around with the bottle. And, you know, I know we're being cute with this bottle and everything, but the reality is that there is a reason why there are so many people in this world that are unhappy. And the only reason people are unhappy, listen to me, the only reason people are unhappy is because they are refusing to grow. Like if you're trying to find the reason of why you're so unhappy, why you're so unsatisfied, why things aren't getting better in your life, the, the honest to God truth, if you want to get back to God's truth, God's word, there's only one reason. You do not challenge yourself to grow in that area where you're still acting like a baby. 
And until you face your reality, until you start addressing, until, until you start learning, until you start opening the book and start finding the right answers to whatever issue, baby issue that you're dealing with. Now, I'm not trying to be insensitive, but at some point, hopefully that baby issue turned into a solid outcome where you have learned how to develop your spiritual muscles, your spiritual intelligence, your spiritual fortitude, your spiritual perseverance, your spiritual overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of your testimony. And then now things start getting just a little bit better. Would you agree with me? And so that's a major reason why people are unhappy. Let me tell you something. The reason that most Christians, that's just people. It's not about Christians now. The reason that most Christians aren't happy is because they suck. Wow. Always sucking the life out of someone else who's grown up spiritually. Always sucking the life out of the leadership and are unhappy because I'm not growing with my leadership. Well, I don't think leadership is responsible for your spiritual growth. Every single person is responsible to grow up, to develop yourself. The church is important because we come to this church and you're able to hear messages like what you're hearing today at Back to School where we challenge each other, where we're growing, where we're all sitting in a room and we're being students, disciples, and learners of God and looking at principles, looking in the word and saying, you know what, maybe I am a big baby. Maybe he's talking to me. I think we all have a little baby area, don't we? Look at Jeremy and be like, you big baby. <laughs> it's true. But the reason Christians are so unhappy is because they suck. They suck. They suck. They, know, they just know how to suck the life out of people. They suck the life out of a room. Have you ever met a Christian that just, they walk in like there was life in the room. Then they walked in. And, man, it sucks. Or you're at home or you have children, right? Man, you're trying to create a healthy environment, a happy environment. And then they walk in with a sucky attitude. Wah, wah, wah. Let's all do that. Ready? Wah, wah, wah. And if you're offended by my wah right now, you the baby. <laughs> I'm talking to you. Okay, now let's go to the scripture. You guys ready? So let's not suck. <clears throat> let's stop blaming others for why our life sucks. Let's stop blaming people for why our life sucks. Let's stop blaming everybody for why things suck. Amen. And let's look in the mirror and say, I can change. Okay, here we go. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. Are you there? If you're not, you can go there. If you've got your Bibles, go to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse 12. And we'll read all the way to 14. It says this. It says, by this time, you should be teachers. But in fact, you need someone to teach you all over again. You need even some simple truths of God's word. You need milk, not solid food. Sometimes, you know what, you can sit in a service like this, and you're listening to me, but you're choking on it. And anyone who lives on milk is still a, y'all with me? Look, let's read this together. And anyone who lives on milk is still a, and that person does not want to learn. That person does not want? Learn. Doesn't want to learn. Look at your neighbor and say, do you want to learn today? Or you have the person who thinks they've arrived and learned it all. Like, oh, see, probably right there, you know, looking at your kid, but like, man, he's, that's, I'm so glad it's for you, <laughs> you know, or your spouse or whatever. <laughs> Don't look at them. Just be like, Lord, get it in their spirit. <laughs> Look at this, verse 14. It says, solid food is for those who are grown up. They have trained themselves. How, how, did, they, how did you eat solid food? You trained yourself. Do you remember when you had a child or when you were a child? Your mom didn't give you a steak when you were an infant. Your mom gave you baba, right? 
And then as you became a toddler, they started chopping up those little, you know, hot dog wieners and chicken and like, you know, and you're like, mama, you become that little, you know, that bird that feeds your baby or whatever you did, nasty stuff sometimes. And, and you start helping them learn how to not only swallow, but to chew on solid food so that you can start receiving all the proper nutrients you need because milk alone is not enough, guys. Milk doesn't provide every nutrient. It doesn't provide every vitamin. It doesn't provide everything it needs or the body needs in order for it to have proper development. And so God is saying, or the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, there's a time where, yes, you're a new believer. You barely came to Christ. You know, this is all brand new to you. And you have to take on the milk of the word because there's the basic, simple, sim simple things that we need. Like we talked about love last week. Those are some things that are foundational and it's good. But at some point, we have to come to the place where we're now chewing on the solid stuff, the, the, the strong stuffs. But it says here, he says, they have trained themselves to tell the difference, to tell the what? The difference. And I want you to stay with the, on this message because I'm going to share a lot today but this word difference is a big one like there's a difference between you and the person sitting next to you as far as where they're at with their spiritual walk with God there's a difference with every single person that's walking into churches today there's a difference of the kind of believer they are there's a difference of the kind of faith they have and and, and I know we all have mustard seed faith but not everybody has grown that mustard seed into anything some of us have buried that mustard seed and have done nothing with it. And, and you know what? I'm not here to condemn you. Maybe you've been a Christian, a believer, or you've been a, a, one who claims to be a Christian for, you know, many, many years, but you haven't grown up in the things of God. Well, guess what? You're never too young and you're never too old to change. Amen. You just have to start having an attitude of learning. Learning, growing. So it says... And so they have trained themselves to tell the difference between good and evil. That shows they have grown up. So there has to be a measure, right? We talked about last week. There has to be a measure of whether or not you're growing. There must be. You've got to measure yourself. Like the things that used to offend me shouldn't offend me anymore. Like if I'm still being offended by the same stupid stuff, if I'm still letting people crawl under my skin, and I've already been someone that's always had this issue with people. And here I am today, 10, 15, 20 years later, and I'm still letting people get under my skin. You haven't grown up. You're still drinking milk. Or let's say you're falling into a place called circumstance, trial, trouble. And, and there was a time where, man, you'd freak out. But now after years and years of walking with God, you've experienced obviously more trouble throughout the years, hopefully. Right? And why do I say hopefully? Because it's not if trials come, it's when they come. They're going to keep coming. But you should respond differently now than I did then. There should be a change. There should be a metamorphosis that took place in my soul that says I am now responding different and not reacting like I used to. And so the backpack we said last week represents our heart. Right? What you put in, you get out. Just like when you went to school. When you went to school, you took a backpack. And inside this backpack were all your resources, all your supplies. And you needed the supplies. You needed to pull out the books you needed for the, whatever class you were going to take. And how many know that every single one of you right now are in a dip, different subject in your life? Right now, some of you are in the subject of finances because there's been a struggle there. Some of us in the subject of health. Some of us in the subject of get a better attitude. Some of us in the subject of how to grow in faith. Whatever the assignment is, hopefully you already have the tools needed in order for you to go ahead and pull out of this thing when you're facing those trials. And then, of course, we talked about the pencil, right? We have the power to write our future. We do. We have, he's, God says, I have given you the tongue of the learned. Now, that means that what we write, we're writing what we've learned from God, and then beautiful things happen. So as you read this verse, going back to verse 1, it said, by this time, you should be teachers. In other words, Paul's like, man, uh, if you've been walking with God for X amount of years, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be so much of a student anymore. You should be a teacher. You should be teaching people how to forgive people. You should be teaching people how to not be offended about everything. 
You should be teaching people how to walk in love. You should be teaching people how to walk in faith. You should be teaching people how to be committed, how to stay committed, how to fight the good fight of faith. You should, you should be teaching people how to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And Paul's saying, we have a problem. He wrote this letter for a purpose. Why? Because he saw a church full of babies. Do you think Paul just wrote something cute because he thought like, oh, this would be kind of good for them to read? No, he wrote it because he knew there was a problem in the church. There was a constant problem with Christians always acting like babies. They just did not, whether you're acting like a baby, you know, maybe you're not a complainer, but you're still a baby. Like if you were going through a challenge and I asked you, okay, what verse are you standing on? And you can't even pull a Bible verse out of your heart. Then that says you're still a baby. But you've been walking with God for so many years, and you have yet to memorize any verses in your heart. It's not even about how many verses I memorize. It's how many of those do I live? Are you hearing me? I hope you're getting this today. So we should be teaching others, helping others get off the baba and start eating some solid food. Say it with me. I'm called to be a teacher at some point. <clears throat> yeah. Teacher Reynoso, come on. Teacher Ruiz in the front row here, right? Teacher Hughes. Come on, we got to be teachers at some point. We're always, listen, we're always students because you're always learning. But you shouldn't be just a student. You should be a teacher while you're still a student. We should be teaching people how to grow in their walk with God. And, uh, and it's interesting because you do look at the church today and you do see a, 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 a body today in, in church and you see people that, you know, that have grown in their attitude, that have grown in their love, they've grown in their hope, they've grown in many areas of their life. And those are beautiful things. And when I think about this whole series of back to school, I could only think about that. God has made available through his word, through the open book test that he's given us. He's given us not only a, a free ride, right, in school, but he's given us a full scholarship for your purpose. He's given you a full scholarship for your dreams. He's given you a full scholarship for whatever you're going to face. I mean, God has covered you in every possible way. Think about salvation. Salvation means hope. He's giving you provision. He's giving you healing. He's giving you salvation. He's given us a full ride while we live on this earth. Everything is paid for too. That's the cool part. And not just that, but it's a full ride for spiritual development as well. There has to be some spiritual growth. It's not an option. Listen, you can't think you can bring your life skills into kingdom living. You can't do that. I love it that we love, listen, I love leadership. I come from business, and I have a lot of leadership and business skills that I learned in business, but how many know that that wasn't created by man? That was created by God. Yeah. I can give a scripture and a, 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 and, and a verse to every single thing that a leader can give in the, in the world of leadership. No, but you can't just think that, okay, well, I'm bring my skill set into the church, which is awesome. But we're talking about kingdom living. It changes. We should be trumping whatever, whatever earthly uh, kingdom, because how many know that the earth also has their kingdom, right? The devil has his kingdom. But you and I have the capacity to bring a whole other kingdom mindset, a kingdom attitude, a kingdom wisdom into the workforce where you can literally change the area that you work in and that's what I mean by there's there should be a difference when you walk into whatever school you go to there should be a difference when you walk into whatever classroom whatever workplace you're, there should be a difference between what they live and what you live you okay okay in Psalms chapter one I'm not going to go to it here's what it says it says that we are like trees. Say it, I'm, I'm like a tree. <clears throat> and if you read all throughout the scriptures, 
you'll find a lot of subjects that school teaches. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember back in school, they used to have agriculture. I don't know, do they still have agriculture today in school? No? Do they still have in, in high school agriculture? No? They've got, have they gotten rid of all kinds of stuff? But in my days, let me see. I know some of you are too young, but you know what? How many here went through agriculture when you were in high school? Man, right? It was so fun. It was a perfect, it was a perfect area to ditch. It really was. <laughs> and, um, and not just agriculture, but there's some similarities, if you think about it, with agriculture and human biology. There is so much that intertwines with both subjects because agriculture, when you think of plants, trees, flowers, bushes, it's, it's so awesome to see that when God says, you are like a tree, the reason is because trees also have cells that help them produce and develop its own growth, and it's pretty awesome. Well, guess what? Humans, we have cells, and those cells are given to us to produce and to create good and bad things at the same time. Are you hearing me? But how many know that we have the power to decide where they go? And let's just talk about this. So as we're, since we're on this back to school, I thought, let's bring some agriculture today and some human biology. Can we just go ahead and talk about that? Okay, that was just the foundation what I started with. Okay, so there's something that makes a plant grow, whether it's bushes, trees, flowers, plants, whatever it is. And it has something inside of it called a meristem. And if you know anything about agriculture and you're very intelligent and smart in that area, give me some grace because I just did my research. So it's called meristem. Did ever say meristem? meristem? And the meristematic cells is what gives the plant, or let's just call it the tree since we're talking about we're like a tree. It gives the tree the, the, the nutrients it needs to various organs per se of the tree because there's different parts to a tree and it is responsible for its growth just like you and I we have the word of God and without the word of God we're not going to get the proper nutrients in order for us to develop and grow into the person that God has called us to be it's the same it all it all applies and so um, this meristem is responsible to produce something in these in this tree well, God's word is responsible to produce something in you as well. And so when, when it receives the nutrients and, and the tree starts taking in this meristem, here's what's pretty powerful. Like the tree does not have a choice what meristem cells it is receiving. But what's so awesome is that when you study plants, plants can actually make the decision on where they should go. So the tree says, okay, I'm receiving, they have no control of what they're receiving, but the plant or the tree is saying, okay, I'm receiving these, these meristem cells, and these, these cells I'm going to push down, I'm going to put down into the roots in order for this tree to go down or this plant to go very deep, and these, these, these meristem cells, I'm going to go ahead and just allow them to go up. Isn't that pretty wild? And, and so just stay with me. So, so it doesn't have the power to control what comes at it, but it does have the power to make a decision where it goes. And where it goes will determine how it grows. Stay with me. Are you there? Okay, so the tree tells the other nutrients, you're going to go down and you're going to go up. And when you think about a tree, the only way you're able to find out how it made its decision, when you chop a tree down, and I left my bark in the, in the car. <laughs> of course, praise the Lord. <laughs> if you cut a tree and you see the, the bark of a tree, you see the lines that are all throughout the tree, those lines represent the decision that tree made. Look at your life. And where you live today, look at your prosperity, look at your health, look at your mindset, look at your attitude. It will tell you how you decided when you had things that came to your life that you had no choice of and how you decided whether what was going to go down and what was going to go up. It's the same mindset. 
It's so amazing. Isn't it amazing how God just created everything? And then he uses a scripture and says, hey, you're like a tree. And the plant takes what's given, and, and somehow it just knows what to do with it. It just kind of like, it just knows. Um, and the decision is made at the, and this is the cool part. I love this. As I was reading the, the whole definition of this, it says, and the, and, and the tree, it, it makes up its, its mind at the meristem line of the tree. In other words, there is a line that happens in the process of development that the tree has to make a decision right now. Like so many, many of us, right now you are at the line of a decision. And guess what? Sometimes it's easier just to walk away, go to sleep, take a nap, do nothing about it. But how many know that it is dangerous if you don't make a decision? It can hurt you. The same goes with our body. We also receive stale cells. And we have good cells and we have bad cells. Our body actually, as a matter of fact, let's put it this way. When a mother is, is, is you know, has baby in the oven, the, the mother, by what it's receiving, right, taking in, then gives it to the baby. Those nutrients go to the baby. Isn't it pretty, it's wild that the baby has the capacity to decide what, what stem cell line would be best for the heart, for the eyes, for the ears. Literally, the infant says, okay, you're going to go to the heart. You're going to go to the ears. You're going to go to the, the eyes. You're going to, it literally tells it what will go. But at the same time, it's dangerous because there's also cells that are really bad that can also turn into cancer cells and those cancer cells if there if there is not a clear decision will automatically start getting in the way or in the line of certain parts of your body now i get it listen nobody chooses to have cancer nobody choose it, it just happens but the body is so it's so incredibly dynamic it is so super it's amazing how god created us but how many know that we also have the responsibility based on what we're taking in that also has a huge cause to a lot of the diseases that we see on earth today whether it's medication whether it's bad food bad eating grease you name it you can go through the whole list you know not taking care of, not not exercising not doing your part and then, and then we get sick, and then we get mad at God. We blame God for, like, why did you let this happen? But the reality is that you and I also had a decision what we were going to do with all the food that's presented to us every single day. Yeah? You ever go to the restaurant, and you see the fries, you see the salad, and you're like, dang. And, you're, and you know, your head is saying salad at the register. You're like, okay. You already know. You have made up your mine how can i help you yeah can i get an order of fries please <laughs> right i've done that many times like i'm gonna do salad i'm gonna do salad salad can i get a double double cheeseburger you know it, it's just, it just changes you decide that's what happens with us that's what happens with like today many of you are right here sitting down and you're listening but you decide what you're willing to take in or not you can be the person that just has a bad attitude and just nothing's gonna take in or you can be the person that says, man, you know what? It's time for me to just grow up a little bit. Because I keep thinking like I've arrived, like I know this. Like, oh, yeah, teach me something I don't know. Uh, yeah, like this. <laughs> Tap your nerve, like, you growing? <laughs> Are you here today? Yes. So what's interesting, there is a decision that, it, that, that is made. And... That decision will represent what goes up and what goes down. And so that's the, that's the, that, that's the whole issue there. Okay, now let's, let's take this to the scripture now again. How does this apply to me now? Okay, let's go to this. Because your, your soul makes the stem cell line decision too. Look what it says. 2 Corinthians 2.16 says this. To the one, remember we talked about the difference. Look at this. It says to the one. We are an aroma that brings death. How about that? And to the other, an aroma that brings what? Life. So 
you and I have this, this, this difference between this person and that person. And today you're someone that either when you walk into a meeting, when you walk into a room, when you're walking into the life, you're either, you're either the aroma of death, like nothing is ever good. It just, it, you just suck the life out of every situation or you're the aroma where you say, okay, we sucked, but let's bring life. Let's make a change. Let's make a difference. Okay, man, you know what? It didn't go the way I thought it would go. Man, I, I wasn't really thinking or ever wanted or ever chose to have this disease. But you know what? Let's, say, let's see what the Bible has to say. It says, and by his stripes, I am healed. And then we start digging in deeper, right? And as you start digging in deeper, you can start making a decision that though I'm facing this circumstance, I still have the power to decide. Like, I, don't, I may not have power over cancer, but I got power over my decision. I may not have power over my challenge, but I got power over my attitude. I may not, may, ha, may not have power by the words that people are saying about me, but I have the power how I'm going to respond about this situation. I got that power. I decide. They don't decide. Amen. And so, and also, you, you, you read this verse, and you could only think of this. That means that, that all of us can be sitting here today, and you're hearing the same gospel. And to one person, it brings them the strength of the Lord. But then to another person who is in this church and every church in America today that is sitting there, and they're hearing the same gospel but it does nothing for them. Nothing. It's kind of like, okay, good thing I went to church on Sunday. I did my part. Let's go. And then you just go back to normal living. And nothing changes. Go back to the same bad attitude. Go back to the same, you know, unforgiveness. Go back to the same offense. Or you can be the person that says, you know what? No, I have to make a decision that when I come to church, I'm not coming here to fill my two hours of of driving here or, or, or the whole process of everything you do to get here and then sit and hear worship and, and then nothing changes. No, you have to decide what you get out of this today. I can't decide that for you. I can't make you grow. I could only help you grow. At that point, you have to make the difference. And what I've learned in my 22 years of being in ministry, it's so interesting, interesting because I have met with people that have gone through similar circumstances Let's say one was going through, you know, cancer. It's so interesting, and I've seen so many people go through this. Like one Christian will respond in a way that says, you know what, Pastor? I know this is what I have. I know this is what I'm going through, but, man, I'm standing and believing to the very last breath if I have to. And then you have the other person who's heard the same gospel, who's been walking with God for the same amount of time, who then all of a sudden starts blaming God, hating God, angry bitter, resentful, and that goes for anything, whether they've been some, I've seen people that have been hurt severely by someone, and the response is, you know what, man, I, I'm hurt, I'm not denying it, I'm very angry, I'm so angry right now, but I'm dealing with my anger, I'm working on forgiving this person, I, I'm, I'm chewing on God's word, I, I'm choosing to let them go out of my heart, because the Bible says that it's out of the heart that flow the issues, I don't want that issue in my heart. And then there's the other person who gets hurt. Same gospel. And someone hurt them. Someone betrayed them. Someone mistreated them. And they're angry and bitter and resentful and revengeful. And, and, and man, they just wish that person would die. And they just have this bad. And there is a difference. You see, both are receiving the same stem. Right? They're receiving the same issues, things that you didn't choose. You didn't choose to be hurt. You didn't choose to be betrayed. You didn't choose to go through that sickness. But you still had a decision to make whether I'm going to let that take me down or I'm going to go ahead and let that take me up. Yes. That's your decision at that point. And you see it over and over again, whatever issues 
that have happened, but you're either going to get better or you're going to get bitter. That's the only two options. Let me give you this point on the screen. It's not what happens to me, but what happens in me that makes the difference. I'm going to say that again. It's not what happens to me, but what happens in me that makes the difference. Because what happens to me, I have no power over. But what happens in me is my responsibility. That is what's going to make the difference for my development, for my personal growth. Outside of that, you can't help it, can you? When you got hurt by someone, did you ask them, hey, hurt me today? <laughs> hey, slander me today. Come on, gossip me. Today. Like nobody wakes up thinking, I wonder who's going to hurt me today. Like if you are getting up like that, then you're crazy. <laughs> the question is, what are you going to do with that trial? What are you going to do with that circumstance? What are you going to do with that problem? It's what are you going to do about it? And so often we think that, that just because you're a Christian that God shouldn't allow these things to happen. Let me tell you something. God's going to allow whatever you're going to face. He's, but he's, given, he's equipped you with every spiritual gift that comes from above. He's given you every tool. He's given you every answer. He's given you power, authority, dominion. He's given you everything and anything you're going to need to face this life. You cannot get to heaven and be like, well, why got it? God's going to be like, uh, book book i gave it to you right here but why did it okay let's go ahead I, and obviously he's not going to go to the bible right he's going to quote it to you all right he's going to tell you he said did you forget that i am the word and in me you find life and without me you can do nothing right and that's what makes the difference right there so you can get to heaven and be angry and mad but god's gonna be like what's wrong with you are you crazy right i mean he loves us he cares about us you know, it's not like, okay, live your life, boom, go. No, it's live your life with me and let's do this together. That's, right. that's, that's the difference maker. And, and, and I love this because there's just so many wonderful subjects that we've learned in school. Man, there's nothing new under the sun. It's in the Bible. It's all right there. And so look at what um, Isaiah says in, in, in chapter 37, verse 31. He says, the people of the kingdom of Judah who are still alive will be like what? Plants. Come on. They'll be like what? Plants. It says the people of the kingdom will be like plants. Well, if we're called to be like plants, then, then definitely we understand that what God's trying to say to us is that then we have to understand that life is going to throw all kinds of stuff at us but we got the power to decide what we do with them. He says, are still alive and will be like plants. And once more, they will put down what? Roots and produce what? Fruit. That means that whatever you're dealing with, you can either make it bitter, horrible, or you can look at that junk and say, you know what? I'm going to turn this thing into carne asada, right? Or whatever, you know, melon, mango, right? You can, what's that stupid saying? I hate that saying, but... It, you know, something about throw lemons at me and I'll make lemonade. What, how's that go? <laughs> What's that? What's that? When life, when life, okay, when life hands you lemons, make lemonade. Ooh. Okay, well, I guess it applies. You know, when life throws you crap, make mangoes, you know, <laughs> with a little bit of chile limon, you know what I'm saying? Right? When life is throwing darts at you, make pineapple juice. I don't know. It rhymes. But that's what, that's what, that's what this is saying. It says, the people of the kingdom of Judah who are still alive will be like plants. Once more, they will put down roots and they will produce what? Fruit. That means that I can produce fruit out of any horrible or great situation. Like it will produce something in me. Yes, I went through cancer, but it produced in me compassion. Yes, I went through being abandoned, rejected, but it produced in me unconditional love. Amen. So whatever it is that's being thrown at you, you have the power to produce something better or get something bitter. That's your choice. You can keep blaming everybody. Oh, but you don't know what they did. Get over it. 
It's not going to change. You decide how you grow through life and what fruit you're going to produce out of it. That's your choice. Let's look at another verse. Let's get out of here. Hebrews 12, 15 says this. It says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root, what? Grows up to cause what? Trouble and defile many. Let me read that. This is really good right here. I love this verse. It says, see to it. If he's saying see to it, whose responsibility is that? I'm sorry, let me say that. Who, who, who's responsible? Me. Who's supposed to see to it? Me. Who's responsible? Me. I'm sorry, say it one more time. Me. Is it the pastor's fault? No. Is it the leader's fault? No. Is it your boss's fault? No. Is it your child's fault? No. Is it your friend's fault? No. Who has to see to it? Me. Good. Mauricio, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root <clears throat> grows inside of you to cause you more trouble and defile many. You know what that says? When you are someone who is bitter, you are not only hurting yourself, you are a Affecting and defiling the people around you. When you act goofy, when you act all like, snobby and all uh, irritated, always bad attitude, you suck the life out of a room. So it doesn't just make you bitter. See, that's the part. See, that shows you how much. So when you're blessed, he's blessed. When I'm walking in favor, you're favored. When the blessings of God are chasing me down, they chase you down. But that's my choice. It's, I know I've said this before. Maybe you've never heard this. And I, I even told a restaurant owner this week. It's funny. It's, it's so interesting. When I walk into restaurants, they're normally dead. Like There's no people in them. And Felicia's there. I've done this too, remember? I've done this. Have I not told the business? Were you there with us when I told that business? Okay. I walked down, I told the business owner, hey, man, this was what's all your business. Like, oh, yeah, it's been slow. Okay, so here's the deal. We're going to eat here and give it a few minutes, and this place is going to pack out. And they're like, what, what the, what? And just, just get ready. And sure enough, we sit down, boom, the floods come. This week again, I walked in the restaurant, dead, nobody, we're the only one. I'm like, okay. And then as soon as you sat down, bam, it got filled. Why? Because when you're blessed, it also affects the people that are with you. It affects them. Good or bad? You want to be funky? Don't, don't hang with me. Please, I don't want no funk on me. So he's saying here in the verse, be careful with the root of bitterness because it not only defiles you, it defiles the people around you. Are you hearing me today? That means I have to decide. I, I'm, either, I'm either growing better or I'm growing bitter. That's my choice. I have to make that personal decision because here's the reality, here's the truth. You will have at least 10,000 opportunities to be offended to be bitter, to be resentful, to be angry. Come on, the devil don't play fair. Man, at least a minimum per year, 10,000 opportunities to act funky. But how many know at the end of the day, it's what you do with it. You can't help what comes at you, but you can't help what it does in you. That's your responsibility. Problems are going to come. Let's look at another verse. Because here's the deal. We all have spiritual stem line in our soul, and we choose what kind of fruit we're going to produce. Look at Galatians 5, last verse. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace. Look at this. Long-suffering. Nobody ever knows what that means until they say, Lord, give me long-suffering, and then you suffer for a very long time. <laughs> Kindness. Goodness faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such, there is no law against it. 
In other words, please be that. <laughs> you won't get arrested if you're a little kind. You ain't going to jail if you show a little bit of love. In other words, you, you and I can turn the hell, the challenge, the hate, into peace, love, joy, self-control, faithfulness. I mean, you bear the fruit. God doesn't bear it for you. You bear it. God doesn't choose for you. You choose. I said before you life, and I said before you death. Choose. That's your choice. <laughs> what the heck? I'll give you one more. I can do that. Psalms 92, 12, 13 says this. It says, those who do what is right will grow. Like a what? They will grow strong like a cedar tree in Lebanon. Their roots will be firm in the house of the Lord. They will grow strong and healthy in the courtyards of our God. Listen, the palm tree has roots. I don't know if they have that point for me, but look at this. Here's a, here's a little definition of this. A palm tree, the numerous roots act both as anchors and, f and feeders to sustain the growing plant. It also helps it withstand storms, winds, and the ocean. And let me show you this picture. These are the roots of a palm tree. Look at that. So every time there's a storm, the palm tree says, oh, we got to go a little bit deeper. Every time the ocean hits the trees, it says, oh, let's take this ocean water and let's make it into pure water. And let's let it help us grow up. So in other words, you and I, we decide. It's that simple. You come to church. You are in class every single week. And you're either growing or you're not. You're sitting under the same gospel, the same teaching. But you choose which one you're going to be. The one who overcomes or the one who's overcame. The one who has grown up out of being offended, being negative, complaining, or the person that says, you know what? I'm going to choose love. I'm going to forgive. Or you can be the person that's sitting there that says, you know what? I'm so glad that God gave his life for me. I'm so glad that God changed me. I'm so, thank you, Father. Thank you for being so generous. And then you become a very generous, giving person. Or you're the other person that always questions every, anything and everything when it has to do with generosity. You're always looking, what am I going to get out of it? Not, what am I going to give into it? Well, think about it. You, you can't have a, a harvest without planting. <laughs> what am I saying? You got to put in the work. Put in the work. Bow your head, close your eyes. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the richness of it. And I'm praying in the name of Jesus that you would help us to grow. That we would have the desire to change. That we would be hungry for your word. That we would stop looking to people for our development of spirituality. But that we would have our own personal desire to open the Bible. To open the book. To get in God's word. And to see fruit in our life. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.